Shine with our hearts, loving master, pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand the message of your gospel. And still in us also the reverence for your blessed commandments, the putting down all sinful desires from pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things that are well pleasing to you. We are blessed together, beginning with Father, in your all holy good life, creating spirit, now and forever, into the ages of ages. Amen. All right. So, can we recap a little bit about what we discussed last week? Wedding of Cana. Wedding of Cana. What about it? What was significant about it? It was the first miracle Jesus did. It was the first miracle that Jesus did in the Gospel of John. It was one of the seven great signs. What else? What was significant about it? Was there anything allegorical in it? When talking about the uh, the new wine, the wine in the wedding of Cana being brand new, as we said in some traditions, talking about how uh, the water that was used was considered the water that was used for washing your hands, which means that it would be considered dirty water uh, from those pots, uh, shows this complete transformation to something new, something um, spectacular. But it also shows this transfiguration, changing something into to new. So the idea of the very first miracle is related to the Eucharist by changing it into wine. Right. So we're going to go ahead and start into uh, chapter 3 of John. But before we go forward, are there any uh, questions or thoughts um, before we begin this new section? Okay, then starting on chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So let's set the scene already. So Nicodemus is a leader of the synagogues. He's a Jew of high regard. And so why is he meeting Jesus at night? For fear of the other Jews. For fear of the other Jews. Why? What's he afraid of? Mm -hmm. Jesus is suspect. Uh, people are saying, why are you following up to this? This is radical teaching. Although, if they actually paid attention, they'd see that it's not radical. It's fulfilling. Uh, but he's scared. He's scared of losing his position. Now, we know that Nicodemus is going to do something later. What does Nicodemus do later? If we know our Bible history. Later at the end, at the end, after Jesus died, he helps uh, with the, the gentleman that, that with the Joseph of Arimathea, yes. Joseph of Arimathea, yeah. He also, at another point, when the Sanhedrin is gathering together, which is the collection of the Jewish leaders, and they're all saying, well, we need to put him to death, he's the one that says, hey, shouldn't we listen to what this man has to say first? Why are we casting judgment without hearing what he has to say? Right. So Nicodemus is coming right now. He's very skittish. He's very scared. But he is going to show himself in a little bit uh, to show that he does have courage and character and that he is, in fact, a disciple of Christ. But it's very, very important for us to set this tone because, uh, and as I said last week, I'm hoping that we can get both chapter 3 and 4 today because they are they're extremely related uh, for multiple reasons. Because what we're going to be doing ultimately is comparing the people of Nicodemus and Fotini, a man versus a woman, a person in high regard versus a sinner, um, a Jew versus a, a, a Gentile, a Samaritan. So this is very, very important for us because what we're seeing is a destruction of societal norms and expectations of men and women. Uh, this is critical. Uh, because prior to this moment, you know, people were looking at women as basically background characters. But we're seeing within the Gospel of John, especially, that women are having a different role. For example, what was significant about the introduction of the Virgin Mary in the previous chapter? What did she do? She said to Jesus Christ, 
wine. And uh, what did Jesus say? He said, my hour has not yet come. What does this have to do with me? But then immediately she tells the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do. So why is that significant? Why, why is that important to us? It's important because it shows us that the Virgin Mary is our consistent intercessor. That even when we don't deserve God's help, she is going to ask God for us, to help us. So, we have this complete flipping on its head. Now, we've been introduced to this man, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is where we see the very first context of the idea of born again. And the Orthodox Study Bible says, uh, born again, the word again can also be translated from above and clearly refers to the heavenly birth from God through faith in Christ. The heavenly birth is baptism and our adoption by God as our father. The new birth is but the beginning of our spiritual life with its goal being the entrance into the kingdom. So Nicodemus has said, you're from God, clearly. You're doing these amazing things, other signs. Uh, you're a teacher. And Jesus Christ is trying to get him, a teacher, to understand what exactly he's about. So this idea of being born again in order to uh, see the kingdom of God. Now, why was that important? See, the verb see. Uh, in the Beatitudes, we have a verse that says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. When we are full of sin, we can't see God. We've completely allowed ourselves to be full of darkness. And the very beginning of the Gospel of John started with this concept of Jesus Christ as the light. In other words, he is the light that illumines the darkness, and the darkness could not understand, could not conquer. So we have this image to see the kingdom. Now, to be born again, to be born from heaven. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother womb, mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus is taking this in a very literal tract. Does that seem odd to you, the spiritual leader the metaphor there? It's... In a way, yes, but in another way, this is purposeful. So what, what, the gospel, what the evangelist John is trying to show us with Nicodemus is this idea that people were looking at things in a very literal way. So for example, the most um, powerful version of this is people were looking for the Savior to be a physical king that was going to oust the Romans and bring them back to uh, the glory days of Israel. Uh, so people are looking to this new idea, this new spiritual birth. Uh, as the same kind of thing. It's like, okay, well, what exactly is he talking about? How in the world can I be born again? I'm an old man. Uh, I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. So he's completely missed the point. And again, this is setting up the difference between uh, Nicodemus and Fotini because both people are going to be questioned about certain elements of their faith. And Nicodemus, who is supposed to be a leader, he's supposed to be well-educated, he's supposed to be able to talk about these things, and he's showing he's completely ignorant. Whereas Fotini is going to show that she's ignorant too, but she's asking the right questions and she's showing her capability of turning towards them. Jesus answered, this is verse five, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now the Orthodox study Bible says the water of water and spirit is direct reference to Christian baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit given at chrismation. So whenever we have our baptism, it's one sacrament, and then the sacrament of chrismation immediately follows it, the seal and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why this is important is because the disciples were given the baptism <laughs> of blood, most of them through their martyrdom, but they were also with Christ, and they also had experienced a life of repentance. So they had been emptied, they'd been prepared, they were made ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And when did they receive the Holy Spirit? Pentecost. And so when they received the Holy Spirit, they were full to the brim with the Holy Spirit. 
The sacrament of chrismation, the Holy Spirit, is what fulfills that. So it is two elements together. Baptism to be reborn and spirit to basically fulfill all things and to embody. Uh, the reason why this is important is because if we look at the idea, because this is one of the questions that people often ask is, is it possible uh, to do God if you are not Christian? And of course the answer is yes, of course you can. Uh, but the way that we look at it is that it's the Holy Spirit pushing the individual to do good. That it's an outside force moving. Whereas when you are full of the Holy Spirit, it is you yourself in acting. You are moving yourself because now the Holy Spirit is inside of you. You are participating with it. And therefore you are able to grow with it as opposed to it just being a force pushing you from the outside. So there's this element of activity. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The Orthodox Study Bible says, a play on words, the Greek word pneuma means both wind and spirit. The working of the Holy Spirit in the new birth is mysterious as the source and destination of the blowing of wind. Likewise, the spirit moves where he wills and cannot be contained by human ideas or agendas. Do not marvel at this. As I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone born of the spirit so in other words if you are born of the holy spirit if you have the holy spirit in you you are being inspired to go and do things that you would have never known what you were doing prior and yet somehow it makes sense where somehow you for example let's say that you said you know what i need to go to this location and then suddenly there's a person that says i'm in need you didn't intentionally go to help that person but now that person is there, and you are doing it. The Holy Spirit helped move you. So if you are born of the Spirit, if you have the Spirit inside you, then you are being able to do things that you didn't think possible. And you are fulfilling an agenda that is not your own. Now, where else do we see this idea of fulfilling an agenda that is not our own? We see it within the Lord's Prayer itself, which is one of the hardest verses <laughs> for Christians to be able to do, which is, Thy will be done, which is to say the will of God, not my will, not my agenda, but God's agenda. And that's very, very hard for us to be able to break down ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why we look at the water of repentance. This is one of the reasons why we see Jesus Christ pointing to the baptism of John first, which was the baptism of repentance. It's not the same baptism. So just as, a, as, an, as an FYI for everyone, uh, these two chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 4, are all about baptism. That's the main focus. Um, so this idea of being born again in spirit is showing us a new life, the life of obedience to God and fulfilling the will of God, not our own, which is important because in our own will, if we are in the darkness, what are we leading ourselves to? We're leading ourselves to destruction. We're leading ourselves to death. But if we are walking in the way of the spirit, they were leading ourselves to light and life. Father, um, the baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, here, is this, uh, is this related to the charismata of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Um, uh, being able to, to, to use in different gifts, giftings of the Holy Spirit? Correct. Because if you are participating with the Holy Spirit, then you are able to... Uh, basically take part in it and you're able to have those gifts because now they're in you. So whether it's the gift of prophecy or the gift of uh, healing or the gift of uh, teaching, all of these things are coming from the Holy Spirit. Uh, any good thing that you're doing is coming from the Holy Spirit. And this is important, for us, especially as Christians, again, to understand, first of all, not my will, but thy will. But what does Jesus Christ say in another place? He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Which means that without these gifts, without these inspirations of the Holy Spirit, we really can't do things well. We can be pushed to do of good things, but it doesn't have the same effect. It's not as transformative for us. It's not as salvific for us. Does that make sense, Peter? Yes. Yeah. And you're saying that for, for someone who's not a Christian, the, the Holy Spirit pushes them to do good work. Right. I've never, I've never heard that concept. So it's the idea. The Holy Spirit behind that. Right. All good that is happening in this world is because of God's mercy and love, 
which means that they are participating whether they want to or not. This is one of the reasons why we look in the uh, epistle to the Romans when uh, uh, St. Paul is basically saying they have a law unto themselves. Even though they're not Christian, the he's talking about the Gentiles. They understand basic things, certain things, like that there is a God and that like, killing is wrong. That there needs to be certain societal goods. Where does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's pushing them. And this is one of the reasons why we see it in the lives of the saints again and again. Again, people that were good people that were being pushed. And yet, what did Christ always say to those people? You are good, but you lack one more thing. Once they are fulfilled and then they have that missing element, then suddenly everything comes to fruition. Then suddenly everything has its purpose. And of course, Nicodemus again shows his ignorance and says, how can these things be? So he's completely blown away. He doesn't understand what Jesus Christ is talking about. And this another humorous little interlude because Jesus Christ says to him, verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? And this is exactly what you just said. It's like, it, this seems weird that somebody that is well-versed uh, in scripture doesn't understand this, doesn't get this. But we also have to understand that we ourselves are coming from this with hindsight. And as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. For us, we're like, well, of course Jesus is talking about this. How in the world can you miss that? It's like, well, actually, it's, it's pretty easy. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak, we know, and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now, when he's saying you do not receive our witness, who is he talking about? We see what we know. He's talking about the Godhead, the idea that Christ sees things as they actually are. But because you don't understand these things, you can't receive our witness, our truth. Now, is that going to change? Absolutely, it's going to change we prepare ourselves uh, to receive the Holy Spirit, then we will be able to see these things. Now, Jesus Christ, when he gave us the Beatitudes and talked about all the qualities of himself and the fruits of the Spirit, did not say these things, well, these are the things you're lacking and you're never going to have them. It's the idea of preparing ourselves to show ourselves to be able to be worthy of these gifts and then enact these gifts. So in other words, you will be able to see these this is made abundantly clear in the disciples because despite the fact that the disciples were with Christ for the three years of his ministry, what happened when Jesus Christ was arrested in the garden? Amen. Despite the fact that he's been telling them all these things, including I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be delivered in the hands of sinful men. I will be killed and on the third day rise. He's been saying to them repeatedly and still what happened? They still ran away. <laughs> they still abandoned him with the exception of John the theologian, uh, the author of this gospel. But... Afterward, when Jesus Christ came back, he again blessed them and allowed them to be able to receive the Holy Spirit. Then immediately we see this courage, we see this transformation in the disciples, that now they are ready. Now they're able to see these things. So when Jesus Christ is talking to Nicodemus here, he's not talking about things that necessarily were, but things that are going to be. Yes, in this case it is. Uh, but it also has this... Um, uh, element of referring to the future that we because the church is timeless it exists outside of time itself uh, all christian believers in the sense that and we're going to see this later in uh, john when he's talking about the uh his prayer to the father before uh his betrayal where he's talking about I'm praying for the world i'm praying for basically his disciples so this idea of we so we see this a lot in, in the church which is the idea of we believe, we believe that we may confess with one mind, one heart. So the idea is that it's not a thousand different ideas. It's one idea, one concept, that we are united together. It, 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 it's, it's an element of, for, for sure, in the direct context, it's referring to the Holy Trinity. But it's also referring to the idea of the church as a whole. Because the reality is that there are, there are few, but there were a few people that understood this, that understood this witness that he's talking about. Uh, such as John the Baptist, such as the prophet Elijah, uh, such as Enoch from Genesis. Uh, so there were certain elements, but in a more direct, and this is where, you know, Nicodemus needs to understand too, that we're looking at multiple layers. We're not looking at, um, 
we're looking at things that are below the text, that are the spirit of the text. Uh, whereas Nicodemus is just looking at it at surface level and he's missing certain things. And we see this from the, uh, the Pharisees themselves when they're looking at the letter of the law and completely neglecting the spirit of the law. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. Now, what does that mean? It means that no one can go up except him who came down. Now, this is very uh, related to the, to the Neoplatonic idea of the good, which is to say that all things come down from heaven and their destiny is to return to the good. Unfortunately for us, that's physically impossible. Why is that impossible? What happened to mankind that they can no longer go back up? Sin. The fall. They, they, they've been corrupted. Our nature itself has been corrupted. So it's essentially like trying to climb a ladder with no arms. It's impossible. You, you cannot climb a rope ladder with, with no arms. Jesus Christ coming down, he can climb no problem because he came from there. He's from there. So he can get, bring, come back up. And ultimately, when uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gave us an arm back. So now we can kind of climb. We've got one arm. But the only way we get the other arm is when we unite ourselves to Christ and then fulfill our actual destiny to be able to climb back up with him together. So there's this element of transformation within us, that we have been uh, corrupted by sin. His death frees us from it, but we're still not able to actually ascend. But with him, we can. So the other element here that's very, very important is he says, uh, the son of man who is in heaven. Now, we talked about this before, that the very first thing Jesus Christ says about himself is the Son of Man. And again, we're seeing it again. Why is it important that he says the Son of Man? He doesn't say the Lord your God. He doesn't say the Christ. He doesn't say the Messiah. He doesn't say the Christ. He says the Son of Man. Why? Why is it important that he says that? Showing that he's fully man. He's showing that he's fully man. He's showing that he's fully a human being, that he came to show us his humanity, to say, I'm one of you. I've become one of you. I'm not a pretend human being. I'm not uh, something else in the similitude of man. I am a human being, and because of that, I can save you. Now, let's continue. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, this verse requires us to know a little bit about the Old Testament. What happened in the Old Testament? What does that mean, the serpent lifted up in the wilderness? Moses put a replica of a serpent on the staff and raised it so the snakes wouldn't uh, kill all the people, all the Israelites flee in Egypt. Correct. So what was happening was when the Israelites fled into the desert, um, Things in the desert are very arid, and the animals that do exist in the desert, their poison, their venom, is extremely potent. Because there's not a lot of shade, if a snake, a scorpion, a spider, uh, if it attacks something, it does not have the energy or the capability to hunt it or get into protracted battle with it. So their venom is extremely potent. And ordinarily, human beings wouldn't be around it. It's not, their, it's not our habitat. But because the Israelites were in the desert, Invariably, they were stepping on snakes. And when snakes get stepped on, they bite. And because those are extremely venomous uh, snakes, asps, etc., cetera, uh, what was happening to the Israelites? They were dying. And then they said, you brought us out into the desert to kill us. <laughs> and so Moses, at God's instruction, told them to erect a staff with a, with a snake in it. Now, where do we see that, that image in, in modern uh, usage? Medical. The medical field. Now, what's interesting about this and why this is significant, especially for Christians, is because they're basically being told, look at the symbol of your death. The snakes are killing you. And if you look at, it, at that symbol of death, you won't die. It seems crazy, right? You're being told, look at a snake, and then the snake's poison won't kill you. 
Now, Jesus Christ just said, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is he talking about? His crucifixion. His crucifixion. And so therefore, just as we look to the snake, we won't have death. Now what are we saying? If you look to the cross, the cross you will not have death. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, is he talking about our physical life? This is important because, again, Nicola started this by looking things in a very um, literal way of saying, okay, uh, so I'm going to go back to my mother's womb. That, that's impossible. I don't even know if she's still alive. Uh, Jesus Christ is now saying, you will have eternal life. Now, this is important because prior to this, eternal life basically was damnation. There was no one really in heaven. So by saying, you will have eternal life in me, if you believe in me, that is giving the promise of absolute immortality. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I skipped for the most important verse. <laughs> Uh, 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we've seen this, this word t twice now, will not perish, will not die, despite the fact that we do die and we are perishing, but we're not perishing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we're seeing this relationship between God the Father and Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. So his, his child, why is that significant? What is this a, what is this a callback to, this John 3.16? What happened in Genesis that this is a direct reference to? Oh, what is it? He gave up his sons to be, to be killed. It's death. when Abraham gave up his son Isaac, the promised son, the begotten son of the promise, was given to Abraham. Abraham had waited for years and years and years and years and years for this promised child and he got the child. God say to him, I'm going to ask you to sacrifice him. The thing you've been waiting for your whole life, this thing that you've treasured and wanted, you're going to have to kill it. And Abraham didn't hold back. He was going to do it. He was going to sacrifice his son. And at the last moment, God replaced Isaac with the ram. And allowed that to be sacrificed and said, and that was the sign that basically showed that Abraham was faithful to God. This is one of the reasons why when we say the faith of Abraham, which we don't have, can any of us say that we would get rid of the thing that is our most treasured, the thing we've asked God for, we've been pleading with God to have this, and then to have it taken away. Not only taken away, but taken away by the person that gave it to us. Perfect. Especially a child. Your child, your flesh and blood. And so Abraham showed, I have that kind of faith. This is why we say Father Abraham. This is why he's the father of many nations, why we compare ourselves to his faith. Was he sinless? No. Abraham made mistakes, made a lot of mistakes. But this was his faith in God and what we are trying to emulate. And so what's very, very important here is that God replaced the sacrifice for Abraham. Was a ram stand-in given for Christ? No. Jesus Christ was slaughtered. He was killed. And it reminds me of a uh, story of a, a man uh, who lost his son uh, at the border. Uh, his son was uh, uh, captured by uh, uh, drug cartels, uh, tortured, and ultimately uh, shot twice in the back of the head. And so this man, this father, was just absolutely devastated. He said, I cannot believe this has happened. I cannot believe this, is, this has happened. My son, my child, my, my baby. And the priest that was comforting at the time said, I cannot even imagine the pain that you're going through, the agony that you're experiencing. However, we have a God who knows exactly what you have gone through. We have a son tortured and murdered. Our God understands. Now, 
this is important. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Meaning that the Father allowed Jesus Christ to go to earth with the explicit purpose of his death. We talked about this a uh, week before. In the creed that we recite, which is the statement of our belief, what teaching of Christ is present? None. He doesn't say a word. There is no word. It goes straight from his birth to his crucifixion. Because Jesus Christ, yes, he is a teacher, and yes, he is revealing things to us, but his explicit purpose of coming here was to be that sacrifice. This is why John the Baptist, within chapter 1 and, uh, well, no, chapter 1, said, Behold the Lamb of God. Why? Because Christ is the sacrifice. He came to sacrifice himself, to die for us. And this is because the world was worth saving, that he loves us this much. And that if we believe, we have faith in him, we will not die, but have eternal life. And this can only be done through baptism. This is the first step, first journey into it. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So here, he's not mincing words now. He's not using allegory of the Son of Man. Now he's actually saying the Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What does this mean? It means that despite the fact that God has offered this great sacrifice, still people reject it. Still people choose the darkness and they commit themselves to their evil deeds. This great gift that was offered to them, they reject, utterly reject, because their deeds are evil. The light came into the world. This is why that, that one verse in the beginning, uh, when it says that the darkness could not overcome the light or the darkness did not understand the light. Uh, sort of a double entendre with the translation. But again, it comes here that they didn't get it. They did not understand this light. One of the speakers that I've been listening to talk about um, is, is no, first has no atonement. Correct. No atonement theology. So what's the, what's the distinction here? The, the atonement is that, that God caused it to happen? In order to uh, so the atonement, payment, payment for the so the, ato the atonement idea is that uh, we've racked up a debt with our sins, and therefore it has to be paid. It has to be paid with a sacrifice. It has to be paid with like uh, you know like a, a financial tra transaction. Um, whereas, and so that basically Jesus Christ is that propitiation. He is that 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 payment, that, that, payment. Pay, that, that yeah. payment for it which the Orthodox Church doesn't view it in exactly that way. The way that the Orthodox Church views it is that humankind, its very nature itself, had been corrupted in sin, and so therefore was completely condemned because of that. Jesus Christ becoming human and dying on the cross completely altered our humanity. This is found especially in Romans chapter uh, 5, um, verses 3 through 12. Or, yeah, I believe that's the correct verse, where it says that through sin... Death came into the world, and therefore all men died because all men sinned. And just in the same way, it talks about the idea of one man being righteous saved us. So it's this idea that we're all connected. All of humanity is connected. The same way that the Godhead is all connected, we are all connected. So there's one God, three persons. There's one humanity, trillion, beyond that, persons. And all of us, because of the sins of one person, it doesn't just use the distinction of Adam or Eve. It just says through man, humanity. Humanity said one person sinned, it was enough, corrupted everybody. So our entire nature is polluted. This is one of the reasons why we had to be kicked out of the garden. It wasn't punishment. It wasn't the idea of like, shame on you, get out of the garden. It was the idea that if mankind ate from the tree of life in the garden, what would have happened? What would have happened if man ate from the tree of life in the garden of Eden after the, after the fall. After the fall. Yeah. After sin had entered. They did eat from it. You're saying if, if they ate after the fall. Right. What would have happened? Die. They would have been condemned forever. They would have been condemned forever because now they're immortal, but they're separate from God. 
it would be separated forever. So it was not punitive, and it wasn't even pedagogical. It was to save them. Because from that very moment, we see that, that God said that your seed, talking to, to Eve, will be enmity against the serpent and will crush the head of the serpent. This is a re reference to Jesus Christ. So in other words, from that moment, and even before that, our salvation was planned out. That he knew, even from then, that his son, Jesus Christ, would be sent to the world to save it. So our salvation was starting from that very moment. Father? Yes. I have a question. When we say begotten son, what does you mean by begotten? Uh, begotten means like in the natural way. In other words, he is of that person. That is begotten of him. Uh, in other words, wasn't made in a test tube. Uh, wasn't made from other elements, but begotten uh, of that person. Birth? Right. Birth. Is he talking about the future birth, in other words? His future birth? Or no. Uh, this is one of the, if you've heard this expression, laugh a little bit, because uh, if it's a paradox, it's probably orthodox. <laughs> so it's the father is eternally creating, the son is eternally begotten, the spirit is eternally proceeding, with no beginning and no end to any of those statements. It is how we, we understand and express ourselves within it. So it's paradoxical. So the idea that Jesus Christ is begotten, and yet there is no beginning. So when was he begotten before all time? We don't know. We, get, we just go with this because that's what God told us. Okay. So the, so the first eating of the fruit caused us to be immortal? So they were never really eating of the tree of life. They were eating of the fruits of the garden. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Because they were still going, they would have lived forever regardless because they had no sin. So, for example, Jesus Christ, if we hadn't murdered him, he would not have gotten old. He would not have died because he had no sin. Sin is the corrupting element. It is what allows us to die. That's one of the reasons why we start to die from the moment we're, we're born. Our, our cells immediately start to decay from the moment we're born. As, as uh, morose and uh, macabre as that sounds, it's true. Uh, but Jesus Christ would not have. This is one of the reasons why it was actually kind of the, the greatest trick that the devil ever, or that, that God ever played on the devil was that if the devil really wanted to stop Jesus Christ from doing what Jesus Christ wanted to do, he just would have left him alone and said, don't touch him. Because by Jesus dying, which was his mission, by him being murdered and able to go down into Hades and rescue us, that is what transformed our nature. That is what allowed us to take part, become part of the community. Because in order for Jesus Christ to save us, he had to touch physically every aspect of our, of our being, which included death itself. So every element. This is why uh, St. Athanasius says, that which is not assumed is not saved. Which means Jesus Christ couldn't just partially be man. He had to touch all of us. So our humanity changed because of that. So what Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were eating whatever they were eating. And maybe they were eating from the tree of life, but because it wouldn't have really mattered. But when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when they had God's direct command, they had become corrupted. Death had entered into them. Now they are it's going to die. Able to see sin now? Prior to, so prior to the, the tree of the knowledge, no sin they had no sin. They right. They had no sin before they ate. Now that they've got sin, now because of sin, the direct recompense of sin is death. And the first sin is to disobey. Correct, by eating. by eating. And we see this element within uh, when in Eve because there are three things that Eve did wrong uh, when she encountered the serpent. was First, she entered into dialogue with the devil. Second, she created her own reality. And third, she tried to defend God. First element, she got into an argument with the devil. Um, anyone that tries to argue their own case against a lawyer they say that that person has a fool for a client. You can't out-argue the devil. This is one of the reasons why Jesus Christ, when he was uh, in the you know, mountain of temptations, when the devil was uh, trying to tempt Christ, Jesus Christ did not enter into protracted arguments with the devil. He gave one-word scripture answers and turned away. Not that Jesus Christ couldn't have argued with the devil. He could have. 
Jesus Christ knows scripture inside and out. He's got but he did that to show us how we ought to do it. So instead of doing what Eve did, which was entering into a dialogue with the devil, she should have just said, nope, sorry. God said, no, done. Instead, she entered into dialogue. The second was she created her own reality. God said, according to Genesis, do not eat of the fruit or you will die. Eve inserts, God said, don't touch or eat. So she's creating her own story. She's not sticking to what was presented to her. And then second, she's defending God, trying to basically rationalize what she's doing. Within the person of Jesus Christ, we see that he takes all three of those and does the opposite. He does not enter in protraction. He sticks to the law, what the law is, and he doesn't defend God. He just shows what is. So when she ate of that of that fruit, she had corrupted herself. And she corrupted Adam. By, by virtue of that, all of man and kind is corrupted. This is emblematic in their very names. Because Adam, what does Adam mean? Man. man. Man, it's a Hebrew, Adam. And Eve, Eva, means what? From man. Nope. Eva is uh, the Hebrew word for the Greek word of Zoe. Oh, life. Life. So humanity and life have now been corrupted by sin. This is on purpose. Now, on purpose meaning that the, the, the language that we're using here. Uh, so they have been corrupted. Humanity itself is corrupted. Life has been corrupted. It is now in death. So let's get them out of the garden to save them. When Christ dies for us, he restores that original beauty. And this is why Jesus Christ is called, I can't remember which verse in the New Testament, says he is the second Adam, the new Adam, the new creation, the new humanity. So now we are trying to be like him. And that's what the goal of sainthood is, is to be like Christ, to, ha- to basically live up to our measure, to become real human voice. We're like Pinocchio. We're <laughs> pretending to be human. We're trying to become real. I want to be a real boy. <laughs> Uh, in the light of Christ, in his divinity. And this is what Jesus Christ is talking about in baptism. We have this capability now to be able to fully participate, to have full union. And the fact of the matter is, is that this is made possible because he is lifted up on the cross. And this is made possible because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is why you see John 3, 16, or at least you used to before it became politically... Uh, show your faith but this is why you saw it everywhere because this is one of the most important verses in the entire bible you know one of my favorite uh scenes from uh the uh, the book a tale of two cities is when uh one of the main characters who looks like the protagonist is going to the guillotine and he keeps repeating that verse over and over and over again to give him courage because he's going to die for a just man And this is what gives him the courage to do it. This is what gives him hope to understand that God did this for us so I can do this for another person. It's a beautiful thing. One more time, the reason they needed to get out. They needed to get out of the garden because if they ate ate from the tree of life, they had been corrupted after sin had entered into them. Because sin is separation. It's basically we take a rope between us, sin cuts that rope. So we are separated. We are no longer able to have union. So because of sin, there's a wall. This is one of the reasons why we needed the baptism of repentance, which is what John had. This is why we have confession within the Orthodox Church to try to reestablish that bond. So that bond has been severed irrevocably. Our nature has absolutely been brutalized because of sin. What we were is corrupted. That corruption stayed that way. If we had taken the tree of life and eaten of that, and we'd live forever separate from God. So it would be basically damnation. It would be hell. Because hell is not a place of fire and brimstone. Hell is separation from God. They had separated themselves from God through sin. And the only way back is through Christ. We're going to see that God gave them many opportunities throughout the Old Testament to come back. There were so many ways that God tried to give them the opportunity on their own to come back. But the Israelites again and again and again and again Again, squandered those opportunities, misrepresented 
God killed his, killed his judges. Um, and so it ultimately became necessary that the only way that we could be saved was for God himself to take it on himself to die for us, to basically take on our fallen, broken nature and change it, to make it something new, to transform it into its original beauty and give us the ability to redeem ourselves. So basically, Christ dying brought us back to the level of Adam and Eve, that moment of like, okay, we have the potential to become like God. Because that's, our, that's the meaning of life. That's the goal of life. Deification. Theosis. God became man, according to St. Athanasius, so that man could become like God. That's our whole life. That's what we're trying to do. And so what God did by dying on the cross was he reset it back to zero. He gave, basically says, now all of you are born without sin. You're still in a sinful world. You can still be corrupted by sin, but your nature is no longer corrupted. This is one of the reasons why as the Orthodox Church, different from Catholicism, we do not have the, uh, the dogma of original sin anymore, which is to say that if a child dies before baptism, it's going to hell. Uh, our belief structure is that because that child has no sin, baptized or not, that child has not separated himself from God, and so therefore is going to paradise. So a lot's going on in chapter three and four, huh? <laughs> How, how literal uh, do, you, do you see this? In which aspect? The, the, the garden, a, a real physical geographical place. If we, would we, know that it was a, we know that it was a real place, uh, that it existed between the Euphrates and the Tigris River. So it was in what is now modern day Iraq. Uh, but like everything else, there's literal and there's allegorical. Uh, the fact that it's Adam and Eve, that the literally... Like the first human being is named Adam, and the second person is uh, as Eva, life, human, and life. Uh, we look at this as both literal and allegorical, in the sense that we see Adam and Eve as the first and the only human beings. But what do we know about genetics? If siblings can join with each other, what happens? Oh, yeah, <laughs> terrible things. <laughs> terrible things. Our our DNA is not is not built for that. It it you know deteriorates very quickly, and we. See what happened to some of the Egyptian royalty uh, with severe birth defects, uh, you know, physical and mental, uh, and they don't live very long. Uh, so just from biology, we can assume that Adam and Eve were not the only human beings. And further, we know this because when their children, Cain and Abel, interact with each other, Cain kills Abel. Cain is cast out. And what did Cain say? He said, they're going to kill me because of what I did. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> Who? Yeah. Who can kill you? Well, clearly there are other people, which means that this is taking place both literally and allegorically in the sense that, yes, sin happened because of the sin of two individuals, Adam and Eve, but its ramifications affected everyone on the planet. So everyone is now affected because of that. So the all of nature itself the planet itself is changed because of it. So there so is some time. God, you think God created additional people after Adam and Eve? There, it's very, it's impossible for me to say, uh, because for example, the uh, you know some people like to look at the elements like, okay, did God make us out of rocks or out of evolution from apes? And ultimately, the way that uh, the Orthodox choose to look at it is doesn't matter. Because until we have that moment where it says and God breathes life into man, it doesn't matter. Whether you're made from clay or whether you're made from a man that grew out of apes, that moment when you receive the divine breath of God is when we become actual human beings. Uh, and that's important, too, because the verb for breath in that moment is present participle. Uh, what does present participle mean for any English wonks out there? Continuous. Yeah, continuous, isn't it? Yeah. It's continuous present, which means that it's a verb that means it's happening and it keeps happening because you have not established an end, which means that the breath of God that man received at that moment was not a one and done, and you're done. It means that our soul, which is what that is, is continuously happening. It is continuously present. 
And by present, I don't mean, you know, a bit state of being here. It means that it is constantly happening right now. Now, that's interesting because it means that mind is comprised of three elements. Everything else is comprised of two. Everything else is comprised of matter and spirit, that animating force. This is why you see in the Psalms, which says, take away my breath and I die and return to the dust, which means that spirit, take away that spirit, everything dies. <clears throat> Made of manner, matter and spirit. Man has three elements, soul, spirit, body. This is seen in scripture when the Virgin Mary says, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. She is articulating all the natures of her being, giving glory to God. So all of our humanity is, is present at that point. Now, again, whether or not that happened, you know, at a single juncture where God made clay and said, boom, there's man, or whether God said, okay, man has reached its state of evolution where now I can step in. And we know he does that because, you know, why did he pick the time that he picked uh, to come as the Christ? It was because that was the right time because of the Roman uh, empire creating safe roads because of the language uh, surrounding everything was perfectly timed for Christ to have the maximum impact specifically prophesized the specific time. So whether that, you know, happened because of rocks, whether that happened because of our time and evolution, it doesn't matter because God's creative command and action took place. Now, whether or not it meant that Adam and Eve were created and then suddenly God said, okay, and now, boom, uh, now there's the rest of creation. Or whether or not Adam and Eve, there was all of creation already there, Adam and Eve were just in this location, and then, poof, things happen. It's not clear. And it's very hard to be able to uh, look at that because, first of all, um, if we look at the writings of the Old Testament, we know that there's probably five sources. Uh, this is one of the reasons why when you read Genesis, it seems very odd that there are two creation stories back to back. Why would you need two creation stories? Well, because two sources uh, were basically writing to say, okay, what are we trying to get at? What is our focus? And the reason why this was possible was because when you would have uh, the text, it wasn't like a printing press where you could just ream them out. They'd be copied by hand. In addition to that, you would have what was called the Talmud, which was writings on the outer level, which is basically notes uh, for the original text. And what would happen is as scribes were writing these down, some of that stuff on the sides would make its way into the main body of the text. What's amazing? And that, the writing down there. Yeah. Exactly. So all of this was oral. I mean, the fact that we say that Moses was the one that uh, wrote all this down, well, that means that Moses is how far removed from Abraham. We basically are seeing a oral tradition that is being passed down, passed down, passed down, with different authors asserting their interpretations and in what they find important. What is amazing and critical to us is that despite that, despite the multiple authors, despite the fact that this was passed down orally and there isn't this level of clarity, it is still every word is important. Every word is predicting and showing our salvation. But what's amazing too is that certain elements of this are found within our own life. For example, the story of, of Genesis and creation very closely mirrors the progression of life that is stipulated within the Big Bang Theory, how each level would happen, how light would happen, and then the next thing would be water, and the next thing that would be would be bacteria, and then after bacteria, more and more evolved life. Uh, so that mirrors in, in that as well. The other thing that's neat is with Noah, uh, we also see in the Far East the story of Utnapishtim, which is another Noah-like figure. What's even more interesting, than that, despite the fact that there are two stories of a flood, which are interesting because it corroborates what was basically a world altering event is that if you look at the fossil record in those areas, it corroborates it as well. Because what you see is the, you know how you go each tertiary level, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, older, older, older. How you do some carbon dating is how you're able to say, okay, this is 50,000 years old versus a million years old. Well, they saw that there were certain rock formations that were inverted. 
where it actually got younger going down. Well, how would that be possible? The only way that'd be possible is if there was like a tidal wave structure, something that was water that was going so hard, so heavy, that it literally took the top layer of the earth and flipped it in certain areas, which shows that there is like, that can't happen without there being so much water, so much force in that one moment uh, to be able to rip that, that section apart where basically, and then the fossil record continues after that. So you see that they basically, you know, 20,000 years ago, let's say, I, I don't have the exact dates. It's like, okay, you go down 20,000 years and then suddenly 5 million, 4 million, 3 million, 30,000, 6 million, where you see that basically that one area in the fossil record shows that something big happened in that area of the world. Something so mon monumentous, the first layers of the earth over. So we see that history corroborates a lot of what we're seeing here. Now, how much of it is literal? How much of it is allegorical? It's hard to say. But this is why it's very important for us to not go out of the text. We can't start making things up. That's what Eve did. She started making things up and putting things into the text that weren't there. But what we can do is when we look at certain things that are in the text itself, say, okay, what is he actually saying? What is in there? What is he actually talking about? So when Jesus Christ is talking about being born again, no, he's not talking literal. He's not talking about going into your mother's womb. He's talking about being born again of spirit, being born again from above, to have your cre the creation you completely change. This is one of the reasons why I always joke when I uh, baptize people. I says this is no longer uh, little Vasily. It is Vasily 2.0 because the old man is dead. He's now something new. He's a new creation through his baptism and chrismation. Now he's a child of the spirit. But I'm a little sad because we didn't even get through <laughs> we get to chapter three. Just the normal time to quit. Uh, normally we do an hour. Um, but we will take time for questions and uh, thoughts. Uh, and then uh, next week we will finish chapter three and uh, continue to uh, chapter four where, where we're going to meet Fotini, uh, the ruin of the well. Um, our guest uh, student here joining us today, he's actually in town just for a little bit. He's going to the Holy Lands uh, this evening. So uh, we're very, very glad that we had you with us. Um, if you want to join us online, uh, in future classes, uh, just go to our St. Basil website, the uh, Education Ministries on the Bible Study, and then Tuesdays at 10 a.m., just log in. Any questions uh, from the uh, students online? No. All right. Then I pray that everyone has a wonderful week. Um, I love our Bible study sessions, and I can't wait for us to continue on. Thanks, Father. Comfort, spirit of truth, present all places, filling all things, come and dwell in us, cleanse our stain, and save our souls, the gracious Lord. Have a blessed and wonderful week. You as well, Father.